Whenever I meet a new deputy, I always ask him for his gun. And I ask him real nice. I'm sorry, Mr. Cat. I'm afraid this here is one gun. Your collection is going to be minus. <laughs> you mean I'm going to have to take it? If you can. Now, oh, hold on, hold on. Get excited here. So by the time the late 30s rolled around, westerns were no longer a new genre, but I think they were not only coming into their stride, but were about to produce some out-and-out -out masterworks uh, of an art form that was still only 40-odd years old. Now, 1939 not only saw John Wayne break through in John Ford's Stagecoach, uh, but this year also produced Destry Rides Again, uh, which has James Stewart star in his first kind of quote-unquote proper big-budget western. He had made the little scene uh, of Human Hearts the year before, I will admit, and this is also the movie that apparently reignited Marlena Dietrich's career after she was placed on the infamous box office poison list um, and was such a success for its underachieving director George Marshall that he remade it pretty much shot for shot 15 years later. Let's take a look. So 1939's Destry Rides Again takes place in the town of Bottleneck. Uh, you know, one of those up to no good towns that has a corrupt mayor who appoints the town's drunk as sheriff when the previous one mysteriously disappears. Ah, you fools! But I'm telling you, this town of Bottleneck has got to respect law and order or I'll put everybody in jail! Ah! <laughs> the sheriff's right. Now you can see why I chose such a strong-minded man. <laughs> Unfortunately for the mayor and his nasty sidekick Kent, uh, played by Brian Don Levy, uh, the new booze-soaked sheriff decides to hire a new deputy, uh, the job going to Thomas Jefferson Destry, uh, played by James Stewart, whose father was a legend and a lawman who used to run Bottleneck. So not only does the town now have a drunk sheriff, it also has a deputy that doesn't like guns and violence and prefers to charm his way out of dodgy situations. See, if I would have had a gun there, why... Well, I... One of us might have got hurt and might have been me. I wouldn't like that. Would I? <laughs> now, it's no surprise to discover that the previous sheriff's disappearance involved uh, a spot of the old murder. Um, and will Destry be forced to use his guns eventually and take action? And how does Marlena Dietrich's saloon singer Frenchie factor into all this? Of course, I could have come barging in here with all sorts of remarks. Like uh, a couple of rumors I just heard about you. You not only sing down at that saloon, but you also take part in crooked poker games, cheating folks out of their ranches. So, yeah, admittedly, the storyline of Destry Rides Again isn't probably the most original. Uh, it has all those good versus bad story tropes, um, the corrupt authority figures in the whiskey soaked saloon, etc. And what makes it interesting though is that Destry is a pacifist here, uh, at least initially, preferring to talk his way out of trouble. What do you expect me to do? I expected you to be like your pa, come in a blast and behind shooting irons. And what happened? You didn't have any. Why? I don't believe in them. Huh? You did the last time I heard about you. What in thunders come over you since then? I love that he tells these little stories to make his point, winning people over with his easygoing charm and logic. Uh, James Stewart, of course, is perfect casting in this respect. Here he really found his groove. Um, he's always been more likeable than aggressive, but still assertive when he needs to be. Now, the movie isn't lacking in the usual action you'd expect from a Wild West adventure, and Destry does get plenty of opportunity to show his dizzying gun skills. You know, aside from being nice ornaments, a fella can have a whole lot of harmless amusement out of these here toys. Now, take, for instance, them knobs up on top of that sign. Yeah, they're all right. All right. Now, I recently rewatched Destry Rides again during a Western binge that included Two Road Together, Shane and Red River. And it struck me how intimate this film is. Those films I mentioned and many others in the Western genre are famed for their photography uh, of huge vistas, uh, the action covering vast amounts of territory. Uh, now I'll stand corrected, but I may have counted about two or three locations during this film. Um, most of the action revolving around the saloon, uh, the sheriff's office and Frenchie's place. And this does the film a favour, I think. Without cutting away to shots of endless landscapes, etc. It makes the storyline tighter and the whole thing more of a character piece. 
Now, as great as James Stewart is here, he does seem to play a very similar character to the one he did in that same year as Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Um, a guy who's upright, honest, and believes in following the letter of the law. Um, and again, you believe the sincerity when it's Stewart. I think that really works in his favour here because when he finally does boil over and, and kick off, you know he's been pushed too far. So Marlena Dietrich is Frenchy. Um, yeah, she'd been away from the screen here a couple of years and she'd had a great run making movies with Joseph von Sternberg, but by the mid-30s had kind of fallen out of favour with audiences and was getting paid huge amounts of money to star in so-so movies. He shown back some of uh, public favour and got to have fun playing a ballsy saloon singer, which she could do in a sleep by this point. Um, now, I'm personally not the biggest fan of her songs in this film, but it's Deatrix, so her screen presence is obviously magnetic, uh, and she gets an awesome cat fight scene that shows her being a great sport. You know that he would rather be cheated by me than married to you. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? You heard me. And that's what I thought you said. Oh. <laughs> And the film does try and turn the tables on the gender stereotype of the time, having the lady of the piece being the tough and fearless businesswoman and the guy being the pacifist, which is admirable, but it's played more for laughs than any kind of uh, progressive equality. <laughs> Brian Don Levy here plays the villainous Kent with all the moustache twirling pantomime nastiness he can muster um, as his land grabbing schemes are put in jeopardy by Stuart's lawman. Um, I love him in this as I'm only used to seeing him in noirs like the glass key and kiss of death. Do you have any cause at the house today? Men, women and children. Start acting smart with me and I'll slap you around, did you or didn't you? Who for instance? Destry for instance. Why not? That's better. When I ask a question I like a direct answer. What was the conversation? All of it. All of it. Now, I'll admit, I hadn't realised uh, until recently that Destry Rides Again originated as a novel uh, by Arthur Max Brand and that Universal had already made a film adaptation of it in 1932. Uh, for this 1939 version, uh, director George Marshall would revise the script, which ended up credited only as suggested by Brand's book. The film, I think, was sold as almost an out-and-out -out comedy upon release, which is a bit of a stretch. Um, for me, it's a straight-up cowboy movie with some scattered moments of light comic relief. Then I'm off the liquor. A man has got to choose between the bottle and the bad. <laughs> well, he didn't say that. I did. Now, I think what you need to take into account with films like this of this time is that the US was 10 years into the Great Depression and audiences probably didn't have the desire for like heavy meditations on character psychology and motivation. Uh, they probably wanted a good time. Uh, some larger than life characters, uh, some silliness and some romantic farce, uh, an action set piece or two and why not throw in some music into the mix as well. And if that sounds like a good time for you, go check it out. I can see now how you clean up Tombstone. You can start right here. And don't forget the corners. 